Hi, everyone. Um, I want to talk about something we've been uh, experimenting with for the last couple of years, or sort of last few years, uh, aimed at uh, taking our sites and monuments record and uh, kind of uh, making it more, um, more of a research tool than a, than a repository, which has been our issue really with the SMR since its um, inception. But let me just start by talking a little bit about Iceland. Um, it's one of the ma last major islands to be settled in the late 9th century, um, though contemporary accounts do not exist for the settlement process. Uh, we do have uh, kind of a, a wealth of very good uh, documents starting in the 11th century. Um, clearly, uh, lots of kind of communal memory about the, this event. So really from an, from an early start, um, uh, Icelanders began producing lots of text about uh, their sort of about their nation and their identity and about their view of history. Um, uh, alongside that, we have quite a lot of uh, kind of travel travel logs. So we have this kind of history of both uh, perspectives from insiders and outsiders, which um, has very much uh, played a key role in the way archaeological sites are documented in Iceland. Um, so um, I would call Eastlave a sort of an archaeo historical database or SMR because there are many kind of strange sites like uh, like haunted spots and elfin stones. Uh, there are lots of sites that are um, only referenced in historical documents and they've never actually been surveyed, but they've been you know sort of referenced in some old document and then that is enough to kind of include it in the SMR. Uh, so for that reason, only a third of the sites is actually sort of has been surveyed in the field. The rest are um, just sort of floating, floating sites uh, from from um, the archives. Um, right. So there's nothing really new or different about using historical sources for for SMRs. Um, but what we've done recently is develop a sort of infrastructure to really really leverage that uh, those historical sources with our our, our sites. And uh, I want to talk about one source in particular, which is called Jalabok Adna Magnusonar in Polsu Italien, which is essentially just a, it's a land census. It's an early 18th century census by these two men, uh, Adna Magnusson and Polsu Italien. Uh, why is this book so special? Uh, first of all, there are a few reasons. I think the first is that it's written for an outsider's, kind of an outside audience. It's written for the administration of the Danish crown. So a lot of things that you might sort of consider implicit information is made explicit. So it's just much more detailed than anything we see before then in Iceland. Um, the other thing is that the, the two men I just mentioned are two of the most important academics uh, in, in Iceland. One, of course, is famous for kind of saving, if you will, the Icelandic sagas. He was the collector. Who, he kind of did that at the same time as he, he wrote this. And they just got this sort of assignment from the Danish king and they just did it extremely well. So quite lucky to have it. And I've not seen anything comparable to this. Uh, so how does this look? First of all, um, they recorded every single farm in the country, um, 4,000 of them. The ones in the, in the eastern part of the country were lost in the Copenhagen fire of 1728. But we have around 3,600 of these left. Uh, the other thing, for instance, they, they, they tell us what they do every day. So we can not just document their journeys, we can basically see kind of exactly when during the year they're, they're um, describing certain farms. Um, and when you look at the, the, the sort of register, uh, it's really, um, I mean, the best way to describe it is as, as a kind of an enlightenment database. There, uh, there's a lot of structure to it. Uh, every paragraph sort of has its element, data element. Uh, and we start with the name of the farm, um, whether or not there's some sort of ecclesiastical infrastructure on that farm, the value of the owner, the occupant, and so on. Um, and when you start to sort of read this, uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of references to other farms. So this is a, a very kind of relational text. Uh, the owners always live somewhere else. Uh, in pretty much 98, 99% of the cases, the owner has, um, you know, we basically, we, we know where, where that person lives. It tends to be Iceland a couple of times, it's, it's Denmark, but that's already kind of one layer of, of connectivity. Um, we have uh, these resource rights to other farms. Uh, we have lots of these ways to kind of see how uh, farms interacted during that time. Uh, alongside just things we, we know like parish networks, um, Iceland was a trade monopoly at the time. So uh, farmers were obligated to, to, to fish, uh, sorry, to, to trade, to bring goods to market in certain trade ports. So that's another sort of way we can understand how uh, the, the country is really structured. 
Uh, and of course, I've kind of modeled a topology on this. And when we, when we look at how that looks in, in practice, this is just a way to kind of think, okay, you have your central farm, you have your subsidiary farms, you have your environmental resources, and then uh, various connections between these, these farm nodes. Uh, this is what it looks like in practice, taking a, uh, 11, uh, a document from 1140, showing that um, you know, these tend to include uh, kind of local power centers with either direct control, i.e. ownership of, ne of nearby farms, or some sort of pasture and fishing rights uh, in the uplands and the rivers. But also, uh, on the, on the left, left hand map, uh, we see that this farm in the south has the, the driftwood rights to the farm way up there. So it's not like we're only talking about a sort of a near neighbor situation. It's, it's actually, these things extend across the country. And so from this, you can kind of model all kinds of networks uh, based on, um, well, that's a trade port up there, resources uh, down here, that's the resource network. And then we have um, state property networks. We have, you know, a lot of these. Uh, I'm not gonna get into it because it's, it's not that interesting to show a bunch of almost impossibly complex networks. But, but reading this text as a kind of relational document allows us to um, uh, uh, take the sites and supplement them with uh, what we know about how they were related to other sites, i.e. other farms, in the beginning of the 18th century. Okay, so as a digital resource, this book is now, uh, includes roughly sort of 5,000 scanned OCR and, and georeferenced documents. By document, I basically mean um, something at the farm level. Uh, includes about 15,000 instances of relations between the farms and uh, spatially searchable text that can kind of be used to, to work to sort of form working hypothesis about certain aspects of land use. Uh, and this is hosted in a, in a Postgres database. So you could go to, to uh, our website and just search, for instance, this is charcoal making. And already you get some kind of idea about uh, where they're talking about it, not necessarily where they're doing it, but where they're talking about it. And this sort of chimes quite well with what we know about the soil and where you might be able to produce charcoal, or you know, kind of woodland cover, and where you might be able to produce charcoals. Quite quickly, being able to search the whole thing as one has, has proved useful. Um, but the other thing is, uh, it has kind of affected the way we see and survey sites by emphasizing kind of sites in their social relations, um, storing the relations in a, in a proper kind of uh, RDBMS schema has allowed for teasing out patterns from bits and pieces of information from several farmsteads to build a more nuanced picture. Uh, I will say that, you know, this is, uh, although we do know about where these sites uh, exist in the landscape, uh, this is really sort of, it's not ground truth. It is, it is really sort of using uh, a, a supplementary historical source as a model for explanation, uh, which we can use in conjunction with what we say about the sites in the field. Uh, so what do, what do I mean by the kind of bits and pieces of information? So this is just a, a, a kind of a one sort of uh, clear example uh, about rights to a certain waterfall called Laxfoss, which just means salmon waterfall, which to this day is one of the best places to, to fish, to fly fish in the country. And uh, of course, there's nothing in the land census about this place in, in, uh, in particular. But when you actually read, or you have to read the entire fjord, but it turns out in, in five farms in the whole kind of maybe 50 or 60 uh, farms in the fjord, they, they reference that they have um, one or two days uh, net access to this waterfall. So um, there, there's a sort of weekly rota for five farms, two of which have two days, the other uh, three have a single day. But this really has no um, bearing to uh, either sort of proximity, really. I mean, obviously it's a factor here, but it's not the only factor. Neither does it really have any bearing with uh, farm value, which are two things that you would probably assume were key, but you see the most valuable farm in the fjord down here does not have any access. So um, in order to kind of understand the, the land use, you have to actually read the entire fjord, or even by extension, kind of theoretically, uh, the entire country to see who has access, and then you build up this picture, which is impossible from just reading it kind of on a site-by-site -site basis. You have to look at the, the census in its entirety. Uh, another uh, example of, of kind of understanding sites in their context uh, is, is uh, up here in, in the north of Iceland. And uh, this is kind of an inter interesting case. It's a resource claim that one farm has in another, uh, trading has on Hamar. And the resource is turf, turf cuts, which are an essential resource for building houses and, and 
pre-modern Iceland. Uh, but the description reads uh, something like, there's no, there are no turf cuts on ham, uh, on train. Uh, instead, the, instead uh, the tenant has to go all the way to Hamar for his turf, which involves a week-long journey across water and land, uh, involving both uh, horses and ships. Um, and just the fact that we have this description kind of indicates that the, the tenant isn't too happy about this. But in order to understand why this happens, uh, we, we need to consider not just this kind of resource network that I showed you, but also the property network. And we, we see that both are owned by the bishop. And uh, when we actually examine like, what the, like how the bishop's farms in the region differ from other ones, we see that the, when we look at the kind of terrestrial resource claims, it's really those farms are interacting with each other. So this is kind of a, a macroeconomic picture of the, the bishopric managing uh, hundreds of tenants where the decisions made by the bishopric uh, may or may not uh, suit the individual tenants, but it's a kind of, that's not really the point. Uh, the point is, is managing it at a much larger scale, which again, just gives us um, uh, this kind of added layer of understanding these sites in their context from what we may be able to tell by just looking at them side by side. For instance, if we look at Hrein and we say, well, there's no turf here, we might say, perhaps they had a tough time um, surviving here, or maybe we'll say, well, they must have been getting turf from the next farm over. Neither of those are true. Okay, um, we can talk about these kind of uh, juristically or um, anecdotally for, for ages, but uh, we have um, adopted Psylog as a way to really sort of uh, explicitly uh, explain what these relations might, or what the character is and what uh, we may expect to happen once we sort of see emerging properties arising from these networks. And this is fairly sort of new um, since we really just joined Ariadne. But um, for instance, I mean, I'll just run through this. So we began experimenting with SciDoc uh, to define rules for transitivity networks. Transitivity essentially means that if you have A connected to B and A connected to C, then we assume there's some link between B and C. They are somehow more connected than the network would otherwise indicate through this kind of transitive relation through A. That's essentially what transitivity is. But um, since it's a concept from social network analysis, it's really not had much of an impact on archaeology because um, saying that, that there's a transitive relation uh, doesn't tell us much about how things actually played out. But of course, SIDOC has lots of ways for us to, to classify relations. So for instance, we might, might say, if the relation is uh, 75, which is possesses, then perhaps we can talk about property assemblage relations um, arising kind of transitively from those initial relations. Um, still in the early stage, but a combination of network modeling based on historical sources and SIDOC to document the character is proven to be quite useful. And so, for instance, um, if we take, sorry, this slide is probably a little bit hard to understand, uh, but if we take um, the largest property network in the country, which is Skalholt, involving about 380 farms spread across the country, uh, we notice that. We notice that, uh, well, it's it's quite impressive, but it doesn't tell us much. We, we're not really, you know, it's not convincing to say that uh, they were dealing directly with tenants, um, you know, two or three weeks journey away. Um, so if we um, kind of define these heuristics about how, for instance, they might be collecting rent, we can start saying, well, um, we know that uh, Scout Hall tended to use um, sheepfolds in this kind of transhuman system where people are meeting every year to uh, gather sheep for, for rent collecting. So if we just say, well, okay, if you have um, scallop farms who all share the same um, sheepfold for the, for the transhumans, then uh, that's really where the, you know, you, you, can, you can kind of take the, the property relation, cut it in half, add the node for the sheepfold and end up with a network. Rather looking so abstract like that, you have it sort of broken down into a much more kind of human or community scale um, using this combination of um, network modeling from what we know from the historical sources with SIDOC sort of splitting and articulating those lines into something perhaps more reasonable. Thanks. <laughs>